Welcome, fellow Storm Riders. You are officially a rider on the Hypnotic Storm, and welcome to session number 50 of Brain Software with Mike Mandel, and I'm Chris Thompson. He's currently power reading dozens of hypnosis textbooks. He's lost over 20 pounds and has no plans to find them again, and he's just turned 61 years old. Please welcome to the center of the Hypnotic World Epicenter, the best combination of skill and humor you'll ever find uh, riding a hypnotic storm that he created. Welcome, Mike Mandel. Yes, thank you, Chris. Here we are once again, ladies and gentlemen, children around the world broadcasting from, podcasting from the very epicenter, as he said, of global hypnosis, steps away from the CN Tower and our training center at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, where the architecture of hypnosis happens on this coming Monday, so it will have passed by the time you hear this. This is episode 50, which is a crucial one for us. It shows us that we're sticking around for a while. We've got five big groups of 10 podcasts done. Five big groups. Of, <laughs> that's right. We'll it's, edit that out. You know what this is? Is maintain the chain, right? This we, is maintain the chain. I mean, we, we have sometimes let the podcast publishing schedule slip a little bit longer. Yes, you have. But we keep, go- we keep doing more of them, and people keep emailing us and telling us that they just love the content. I, I'm amazed that people are still just tuning in. And the number of emails we get, folks, from people who say, I just found your podcast last week, and I've listened to all, all of them. them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is totally awesome. And I think... I mean, I really believe that the the mix of humor and content that you Good bring grief. to the I don't mix want to bring here. humor in. This is a very serious <laughs> We wouldn't want business. to laugh. No. So, okay, let's let's start. We said that for 50, for Podcast 50, we were going to do some cool stuff. And we want to talk about mentalism. Oh. I mean, way back in like Podcast 1, I think we said we were going to be throwing in more mentalism. All right, we can throw in some more. I mean, we taught the Hellstromism yes. and how to determine through idiomotor signals, microscopic mu- muscle mo- movements from another human being, which direction they're thinking of moving, what they're looking at, and so on. And you w- might want to rewind and find that particular podcast if you didn't was hear fine. that. Yeah, that enabled me to do things like find a finger ring hidden inside a pocket calculator hidden inside a cash box under some money in the back of a crowded theater. But it, it looks like ESP, and of course it isn't. There's all kinds of cool things you can do. And my mentalism career started in 1975. Mentalism is a very hot topic now with people like Darren Brown and others. And there's a whole new wave of mentalists out there. I um, can't think of his name off the top of my head. But Trevor Parker, I think, does some great stuff. And um, I find it a fascinating field. field. It's one of the branches of magic where it could just be real Mm -hmm. except it isn't and a lot of it is sold as oh this is the real deal and the problem is if you start selling it as the real deal then you're forced to stay with that even when it's unmasked yeah exactly which means that you're unveiled as someone who's just (laughs) been lying so mentalism is entertainment if you recognize it is a branch of magic for entertainment and it's not as some people say oh it's an illusion no it doug hanning god bless him he's long dead but He used to say, call everything an illusion and change the whole vernacular of magic terminology, which I found incredibly annoying. An illusion is actually a large stage effect, which is performed in front of a substantial audience, something like sawing a woman in half or making a tiger appear, that kind of thing. That is an illusion. Mentalism isn't an illusion. It is a a way of using magic principles, meaning psychological principles, NLP principles, and so on, although they typically don't figure into much of the stuff, subterfuge to create the impression that one can read minds, predict the future, have psychic abilities, that sort of thing. And you don't actually say that you're reading people's minds. Maybe, does it mean that, for example, the word mentalism, the person who's watching what's going on, watching the effect, doesn't understand how it's done, so they're mentally thinking, oh, he must be reading my mind. Right, and you want to give that impression to the audience. But it is entertainment. Mm -hmm. And there's some great, great mentalists out there, as I said. Dunninger, of course. Joseph Dunninger was the pretty well the first. I think he might even have coined the term the solo act. Prior to him, the Pilkingtons had a mentalism act. It was a husband and wife team. And they would do this sort of thing. And he'd say she'd be blindfolded or he'd be blindfolded. I can't remember which way around it was. Heavily blindfolded with dough over the eyes or whatever. So it seemed impossible to see. And we'd go into the audience. And and what am I holding um, in my hand? Oh, it, it's transparent. That's right. What else can you see? It, it's got water in it. It's, it's a glass full of water, and everybody would go crazy. Well, the Pilkingtons had developed an incredible code system uh. that used the same phrases over and over and over on a tree. 
a tree structure. So the first time it was used would give the basic branch they're working on. The second time it would, use, it would be used would give the twig on that branch. And so they could say virtually anything. Oh, it's a coin. What's the date on it? And there are uh, mentalist husband and wife teams out there right now who do the same thing. And I'm not giving away anything. This is all over the web, all in the bookstores. It's a grueling thing to learn the code. And typically people who have learned it deny there is a code. And it infuriates when people think there is one. <laughs> well, Joseph Dunninger comes along. I think he was from New York. And Dunninger, the difference was he was a solo mentalist act. In fact, he didn't, he didn't need any partner. He didn't need any plants. He did everything by himself. And he did his thought reading act where slips of paper would be passed out to the audience. They'd write down names, dates, social insurance numbers, things like that. They'd be collected by the audience, thrown in a, you know, a bucket on the stage. And Dunninger, without opening any of these, would say, who's thinking of Mary? Who's Mary? Is it, it's your sister-in-law. Yes. You're thinking of a cottage you want to buy. Yes. And people would absolutely freak out. Well, Kreskin picked up on this, and he basically aped a lot of Dunninger's mannerisms and so on, the way he would toy with his glasses and all these things. And Kreskin took over and was immensely popular in the 1970s and so on with the amazing world of Kreskin, much of it still online, although he was wearing unfortunate leisure suits back then that were made of polyester with big, huge pockets up on the chest that, you know, and lapels so wide you could land the space shuttle on them, but that's, that's a horse of a different color. So <laughs> mentalism has an interesting history. And I saw Kreskin live at Minkler Auditorium in November of 1974 and thought, I can do this, and began doing mentalism and power of suggestion, and a, a, an agency called Music Shop that no longer exists began booking me. And one of the things I did in my act was just sheer boldness. And it was taught to me by a variety performer called Bill McCrory, Bill McCrory or McClory, McClory, I think, years and years ago. He was an old man then, older guy. He'd come on stage, ride a unicycle, juggle, do mentalism, blindfold. I'd do everything. And he showed me this thing, and I used it for years, and I never got caught. And if any of you have got the nerve and you want to freak people out, this is a great mentalist effect. Here's how I would do it with an audience. And you need a substantial audience to make it work. So it's not something you're going to do at your house with a few people over. Say I had... 100, 200 people in the audience, I'd have a small pad, a small white pad of paper, and a pen, like a, a Sharpie kind of thing. And I'd say to someone, okay, um, write down a three-digit number. So they do. And I take the pad back from them, and I pick another person at random. You can throw a ping-pong ball into the audience or a lawn dart or something to find someone. You didn't question something said, throw a lawn dart. Throw a lawn dart. No, I was thinking I knew you weren't listening. It was when really you said ping pong ball, I got stuck on that. And then you said, you can't okay, buy lawn darts that's anymore. That's hilarious. So I'd go get, get three or four of these. Let's say four. Yeah. Four three-digit numbers from people randomly placed. And the key is they have to be widely separate from each other, separated from each other in the audience. So there's no potential. Right. Then I get a fourth person up on stage and hand them the pad that's been in full view the entire time. And they add up the numbers. Now, this is before pocket calculators. They didn't exist back then. You're not going to do it with a slide rule on stage. That's <laughs> my dad called it a guessing stick. So they add it up, and they get a number, 2,611, and we have another envelope that's an envelope that's hanging from a string up on the ceiling in full view the whole time. We tear this down and open it, and it's the identical number, and everyone goes nuts to use the medical, medical term. term. <laughs> right. Now, it's so freaking easy. All it takes is guts. Okay. And you have a second set of numbers that you have written yourself in advance on the, oh. on the back of the pad. So I'm showing you with an iPhone here, Chris. Actually, oh no, it's, it's a, mine. It's a Samsung, Samsung Galaxy. Um, yeah. We just made Sorry. 10 bucks doing an advertisement there. Yeah. <laughs> for iPhone. <laughs> so be funny. Anyway, here, so I've got this in my hand. So I've taken the cardboard off the back of the pad, but I want it fairly thick and substantial feeling, but right. small, about the size of an iPhone or a Samsung. So they, I've written my own set of four three digit numbers on the back in different handwriting. So it looks like they're done by different people. Right. Now, there's also a line drawn underneath to add them up. So it just takes guts. So I have the pad face down in my hand. Yeah. I have to have the nerve to hand this to someone to let them write it, knowing that there's writing on the back. That you could, you could you turn could it over. It. And yeah. if you're congruent and just act like there's no big deal, of course, if you act antsy, then they're going to start examining everything. Yeah. But if you act really offhand, nobody does. Nobody oh, cares. Oh, man, that's so, brilliant. I never got caught. And they write the number, and I take it back and pass it over, and we keep doing this. As I walk up to the stage and go up to the other person, I say, you notice there's a prediction here the whole time. And I point at it, and as everyone looks at that, I just flip the pad over with my thumb and hand him the pad. Oh, man. And he now okay. adds them up. So you're you know, distracting crazy. them. Misdirection. You're keeping their attention focused on this prediction card hanging from a string above you so that they just... All like they draw do their is, attention to it. They look at it. Now, there are some hypnotic principles in here too, right? Compliance and stuff. So they are, as soon as you have them, hand them the pad and tell them, write down their number. Right. They don't think, 
to spend the time investigating it no, or anything. No, they're focusing they just, on the number. They just do what they're told. And you say, make it totally it random, a number that means nothing to you, like change, taking their mind off the pad onto exactly. the number. And you, Kreskin does this really well, um, or did years ago when I saw him years ago. He would rush people. That was how he would mm-hmm. keep it. He'd say, I know our time's going. I know our time's going. We have very little time. He'd always be saying there's very little right. time. He does a two and a half, three hour show. <laughs> so, so I just see so much relation here to instant inductions and PGO spikes and stuff where you're just telling people exactly what to do really quickly and they don't have time to think about it. Right, right. I do a higher degree of that prediction now, Chris, which is a variation of a very old trick that I came up with myself. I have my briefcase, which you know looks like it's bulletproof. It's all tight yes. and stuff. But it's It's locked. And I say, somehow, I can't get the, it open. It's not opening. I, someone wants to change the combination. But we're going to see if we can produce an effect to find out the combination of the briefcase. And you know giant playing cards? Yeah. They're four times as big as regular cards. You can buy them at Walmart. The size of a MacBook. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Uh, so oh, I, there we go. Another, uh, another, another promotion. <laughs> Apple. So um, send the money to Mike. <laughs> so we have this these giant cards. And I have nine, nine of them. Ace to nine of spades. Yeah. So they're all the same suit. And we have three envelopes. Someone mixes them up. Puts three in each envelope, tells me which envelope to discard. So there's okay. only two left. Now, two people each take one of these envelopes with three cards. I say, who do you want to be digit number one and who do you want to be digit number two? I want to be digit one. Okay. Take out any one of your three cards. Hold it up. So he's got a six of spades. Take out one of your three cards. And three are gone. We don't know what they are. He's got the eight. So we write in the blackboard six, eight. He discards them. We do that three times. So we have three two-digit numbers. He adds them up. Tries the combination and the briefcase pops open. Now he's oh, tried man. to he's tried to open it first with all different combinations. It's not worked. Now he tries this one and it opens. And I said some people think that it will open with all different combinations. Would you just look what's in the very top of the briefcase? It's a big brown envelope, and he opens it. And it's the same number he's just done on the board. Oh wow! Now that's my own creation. In other words, I might reveal how that's done on podcast one hundred if we get that far. Note to sell. Oh, I thought you were going to tell us Are how you you've done it. Okay. <laughs> that's what I'm still doing. <laughs> okay, now let me ask you. So you were talking earlier about mentalism and how you don't want to stick to a story that this is mind reading or magic or something. So if somebody says, "Well, Mike, how do you do this?" What's your typical answer? Very, very well. Right. Okay. So very well. So you don't actually say <laughs> no, anything. You don't not. say no. it's in effect. No. It's, it, it, it's based on sound scientific principles, right. which is true. Okay, so it leaves them thinking, it leaves them wondering, leaves them very curious, and of yeah. course, coming to your next show. <laughs> so <laughs> that's awesome. All right, um, is there another one you were gonna? Yeah, teach? Uh, let me tell you another one. It's a great one you can do with a smaller group or a large one. I may have alluded to it, but if I have, it's probably forty-eight podcasts ago. So. Forgive me. We're rich in that age where it's really hard to keep track of well, the things the only, people already said. The only said. ones you've taught so far are you've talked about Hellstromism and you've talked about the acid test. Okay. Oh, well, all right then. Well, this is a really cool one. Um, I adopted this. This is a very old magic effect, and it, it lends itself well to mentalism. I've seen Yuri Geller do it. I've seen Kreskin do it, and um, a number of other people will. You need a sufficiently large group to make it interesting. So here's how I would sell it. And we'll just do it on everybody listening right now. Sure. I want you to imagine, just close your eyes, clear your mind. And I want you to imagine the ocean or the sky. And if you have the ocean, it can be calm or it can be choppy. It doesn't matter. Make it in color if you want. If you have the sky, you can have a few clouds floating lazily by. And when you have that, use that purely as a background. And I'm going to cause something to appear on top of that background of either the ocean or the sky. I'm going to make a simple... Geometric, no, wait a minute, I'll make it two. Two geometric shapes. I'm going to put one inside the other and let that appear. I'm projecting it into all of your minds now. Okay, how many people out there saw a circle and a triangle? And everyone goes, <laughs> Woo! I, go, I did. <laughs> yeah. Well, Chris, I, I think you got it the right way around, the way I projected it, which was the circle with the triangle inside. Yes, yeah, so exactly. And one point up. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. A, yeah. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I know our time's going. We've got to go to a commercial break. Well, listen. I don't know. That was not planned, just no, for the it, record. That's and, totally and many of wild. you will have gotten it. Now, with a huge audience, they gasp. They, oh, this kind of thing. It's like mind-blowingly amazing. Now, think about it. You start by saying ocean and sky, which is a complete red herring. It's just to get the person's mind off what you're doing. It, yes. gives them, it gives them the illusion of choice, either the ocean or the sky. It gives them the sense that they have made a free choice. Now you build upon it with another free choice. And I always start to say, I'm going to send you a simple geometric... No, wait. Let's make it more complicated. I'm going to send two. you two geometric shapes. I noticed you did simple, that. You and mean, I'm going to put yeah. one inside the other. And you've got to get both of them to be correct. Yeah. Now... 
what is there? What are people typically going to see? Square, circle, triangle. Well, how many people? I mean, you're not going to get a lot of people going parallelograms. Right, right, right. Rhombus. Yeah, rhombozoid. Yeah. yeah, trapezoid. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, or pentagram or something. No, mostly you'll get circle, triangle, square, rectangle. That, that's it. And circle and triangle, since you say one inside the other, those two are by far the easiest two to imagine sure, together. Sure, And people will almost always put the circle with the triangle inside one point up. Well, because that's the way we typically see triangles course, drawn is one point course. up. Right. And it's easier to see that than a triangle with a circle inside. Yeah. So people will default to that. You'll get probably 80% of the audience will gasp when you do this. Okay, and that's so, okay, let's, let's Let's give this another shot. Let's, let's see if we can do it again. Um, all of you, let's uh, tune in again. You're receiving my telepathic message through time and space and over the World, world Wide Web. So let's see if we can send you another one. Um, and Chris, you can only have to react if you actually get it right, if okay. your telepathic powers are working today. So this time, after everyone has gone, wow, and freaked out at the last one, I say, now I want you to imagine, let's just take that circle for a moment. Get rid of the triangle. I want you to imagine that circle, make it large, clear, vivid, either an outline or, or a disc. Make it an outline, an outline of a circle. Focus on that. And I'm going to attempt to make a number up here in the circle. Um, let's make it less than 50. Uh, I'll make it two digits to make it tougher. And let, let's make the digits odd and different from each other. We don't want 11. That wouldn't count. 33 wouldn't count. The digits are the same. Just let that number appear. Less than 50. It will appear now. Milton Erickson word. How many of you are seeing the number 37? Oh, no, someone in the front here. Chris, did you get 39? No. What did you get? He's 13. Uh, see, he's the odd man out. Most of the time, way more than 13. I think he's probably the only one who's picked 13. Most of the time, people will pick 37. And with a substantial enough group, there will be a gasp with this as well. The second most common one they'll pick will be 39. Followed by 19, and 13 is the last one. Okay. All, those are the only choices. That's true. There's only four possible choices, but you say out of all these 50 well, 30, numbers. What about 31? Well, it could be that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, math is not my forte. Yeah, so you got 31, um, 35, 37, 39. Mm -hmm. There's eight possible ones. That's true, because it has to be, yeah, it can't, the first yeah. digit can't be a five. So you got 13, 15, 17, 19. Yeah, there's eight possible, but you sell it as out of 50 possible choices. I, yeah, actually, that's a good point. It really does seem like. It's oh, only up eight. To 50. And people yeah. tend to go for the 30s. And the mm -hmm. 37 will be the most common one. Right. Now, if you decide to do it, say, between 50 and 100, then it will, and make the numbers even and different, you'll probably get 68 or 86. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I probably it, screwed that up pure, because as no, soon no, as no. you said, uh, as soon as you said, think of a number inside of the circle, I thought of a one. Chris, and you, you, you said, you well, didn't it, screw it up. The only me, one who can fail yeah. is the person listening. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Just kidding. Nice frame. Uh, okay, what else do you want to talk about here? We've got... A few, well, this actually, is the psychology of mentalism, right? Yeah. You're selling something that didn't happen as though it did. You're selling it as though um, something, if someone's had a possibility out of 50 and it's only been eight. So it's, it's, it's always this way you sell it. Mentalism is all about selling it. It's all about a sales pitch. All right, so this reminds me of the concept of a double bind because you're presenting the illusion of, I call it the illusion well, of choice. It's, in it's talking, an illusion is correct yeah, in this case. In, in, the, in the case of my talking to toddlers program, uh, here's another promotion for you. Yeah. I, I refer to this for parents as the illusion of choice because kids will often, you know, want something and you want to tell them, sorry, you know, we can't do that or whatever it is. And so if you can anticipate that there's going to be some sort of problem or fight with your child about something and you present them this illusion of a choice, would you rather go to bed now or would you like to put your pajamas on first? You know, right. whatever and, it and is. That's that, great. And the kid feels as though he or she is making a rational decision and has control. Mm -hmm. And in reality, you're man maneuvering and manipulating them into what you want them to do. Right. Manipulation and, is the correct word because all communication is It is. Exactly. It all, right. Well, I mean, what color shirt are you wearing today, Mike? Black as oh, always. I just manipulated and you oh, just saying it. Just saying it color. Yeah, right, now, you hang on for a um, second. Back up to the, the kid. Let's say it's a kid, a child who does not want to go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Erickson's method? He used what was called the logical non sequitur double bind. No, I don't. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, Here's what let's he said to the it. kid. Logical non sequitur means it doesn't make sense. Okay. So um so when you whenever you go to discuss something with someone and and, and I always say, let's pre frame it that it's an inflammatory issue, whatever it is. Yeah. Let's agree to just use logic. Okay. No, you can't use logic with this. I said, is that a logical statement you just made? Does it make sense? All right. Well, yeah. So you just use logic to tell me I can't use logic. So logic, it has to be foundational to these things. 
Logical non sequitur means it doesn't make sense. But when in a double bind, it doesn't matter. Erickson would say to a child who did not want to go to bed, would you rather take a bath before you go to bed or would you rather put your pajamas on in the bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> so either one means you're going to bed. You're yeah. putting your pajamas yeah, on, right? Yeah, exactly. Or, okay. Or you're going to bed. So I so, do that and I didn't know the name of it. That's okay, cool. That's okay, that's good. Logical non sequitur. All right. But double binds are a wonderful way of getting what you want out of life. If you offer people only two alternatives, either one will get you what you want. This is tremendously powerful. I just spoke to a group of financial analysts uh, a week ago and um, at a conference in Toronto and was teaching them double binds because clever salespeople know this intuitively without understanding the uh, neurolinguistic structure. But if you come up with a double bind that will offer only two alternatives, as long as you ensure that either one will provide exactly what you want, then you can deliver this and get what you want because the brain is unusual in the sense that when we are presented with only options A or B, we don't typically look to see if there's options C, D, E, and F. Mm -hmm. You stop at those two and decide between them. And clever salespeople will say things like, would you rather uh, sign the contract now or should we do it after lunch? The mm -hmm. person says, well, I haven't got time for lunch. I guess we better sign it right now. now. Yeah. And that's a great, great way to offer people alternatives. So if you're having a difficult person in your life or you, you want to be a little more um, congruent and empowered in their, in their presence, if you want to make sure that your choices are the ones being listened to, offer people double binds. Years ago, my wife, who comes from a family who has a history of kidney stones, did not drink enough water. She was just never thirsty. And it's oh, you've a, talked about this one yeah, before. Yeah, a peculiar yeah. thing that if you don't drink water, you lose your natural thirst. And when you start drinking water regularly, your thirst comes back. And so I said to her, you got to drink more water. Gave her all the signs. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Science, not interested, not thirsty. So one day she was sitting reading the Globe and Mail. I came in and offered her a double bind. I said, would you rather have a hot drink now or a cold drink later? And she went, what? I said, would you prefer a hot drink now or a cold drink later? She went, um... I guess a hot drink now. I said, that's right. And she'd normally have picked up on that, but she was busy reading the Busy newspaper. reading, distracted. So she said, I'll have a hot drink now. So I brought her a big thing of her mug of herbal tea. And I said, I'll, I'll bring you that. Cold drink later. Not a cold drink. I'll bring you that cold drink later. But that I said, that cold. one. It implies we've discussed it and agreed oh, to it. Oh, that's And she great. went, okay. So I brought her a bottle of water and she drank that. And then went, what did you just do? So I'm offering just a double bind. In fact... The entire taser challenge that is used by the Royal Canadian it's Mounted Police line. is the Mandel Taser Challenge. That's the name of it. After the person who invented it, me, they hired me to create it for them, and it's based on a double bind. It's police, exclamation mark. You've identified yourself. Stand still, or you'll get a powerful electric shock. So the, the thing is, do you stand still and comply, or do you get a shock and comply? And people tend to stand still. But there is alternative three, run away. Yeah. Alternative four, attack the cops. Alternative yeah. five, get my friends. Yeah. But people tend to either comply or get shocked with the taser. Especially in a stressful situation, right? Of course. I mean, so what happens in a stressful situation is that their critical faculty is not online the same way it normally would be. That's right. It's not online. And just on the whole line of critical faculty, Chris, not critical factor, as we've said many times, <laughs> the reason I mention it That's is because right. I was reading... Uh, a well-known hypnosis trainer's book, just flipping through it to pick up some points and write skating comments in the margins, as yeah. I usually do. My wife said, just laughs. I know, I've seen some I... of the books you've <laughs> lent me. I see your comments written in the margins. <laughs> it might be ranging from <laughs> as if to crap yeah. to yeah. what are you thinking? What is this? this? Yeah. yeah. But um, anyway, he was closer to the truth back then because even though he's noted for saying critical factor now, back then, you know what he was saying in his book? Critical faculty. No, no. He was saying critical faculties. Oh, so he, he, like there's plural. more than one. So he almost got it right, ah. and then just threw accuracy out the window. Okay, and we won't identify who we're talking about, as usual. Right. All right. Um, I wanted to go back to this logical non sequitur thing because when you were okay. introducing the concept of logic, yeah. you said let's pretend that we're arguing over something inflammatory, and we're going to agree to use logic. Go back to that. Is that something you actually say to the person? I say when people say, want to discuss something in an emotional issue, right? They say they don't want to use logic. So let's say husband and wife or something like that, and you're fighting about money, because that's a very powerful emotional. Right, right. You know, but you're always Never. spending money with anybody <laughs> asking me first, and you just went and bought that new iPod <laughs> yeah. or whatever it is. The problem is, you don't the, care about my three feelings. levels of argumentation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So level one is data, which is where we need to be when we're discussing logic and facts. Level two, we're starting to get adrenaline trickled. So emotions yeah. start to kick in. Now, when you get a level two, you got to breathe and slow down. 
and take it back to level one. Because if you get to level three, now you have an Nuclear adrenaline launch button. conversation. And the swearing starts and the freaking out. Is. Okay, so, so when you're at level two and there is a bit of emotion, that's when maybe this would come in? Well, I, I get it. You know, people want to discuss their religious beliefs or something. So well, let's use logic. Okay. Oh, you can't apply logic to religion. I say, is that a logical statement? What you just said? He's, what do you mean? Does it make sense? Yes. You're using logic to tell me I cannot use logic. Oh, that's beautiful. So okay, see, so what do you call that? Being logical. Okay. The problem is most people are not logicians, and they go through a mysticism instead. So we have we have rationalism, we have empiricism, we have mysticism. Mysticism basically is whatever you feel mm -hmm. is what's true. Well, I just know it. I just feel it's true. What, whatever it is, you know, I, I know she loves me. I just feel it. Well, have you ever felt something that wasn't true? You know, you know, Hitler thought just felt it was right to invade Poland. That didn't make it yeah. true. You know, like it, so we have to sort of be careful with this. The one that makes me laugh all the time, Chris, is. The whole idea of um, an a priori argument or an a priori situation. So a priori is in advance. It's what you think before you begin to discuss a topic. What are you bringing to the table as your foundational beliefs? So if you have an a priori that all the people of a certain race are, are thieves or lazy or whatever they are, then, all those Martians, right? So we'll say Martians, Martians, those damn Martians, right. and Jup Jupiterians, Jovians—they're all that, evil and safe. thieves and so on. Yeah, unless we get sued by a Martian In, until who's... until Elon Musk <laughs> colonizes Mars. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was oh, one of your better <laughs> lines. So, if we have this a priori, this belief in advance, then we will tend to put everything through those perceptual filters, and we'll see things that way. And I got in an argument with a family member on my wife's side of the family who is notorious for being a pseudo-intellectual. and I, I love the term pseudo-intellectual. Oh, he, he, he does one of those clever things. He's the smartest person he knows because he hangs around with stupid people. And if you want to be the smartest person you know, it's really, really easy. Just hang around with a stupid bunch of idiots, people, yeah. and you will be the smartest person you know. But he hangs around with people who think he's brilliant because he makes obscure and obtuse states, statements all the time. But I said, you know, you have to determine what a priori you're bringing to the situation before you argue this point. He said... I don't have any a prioris. I'm just, I'm just logical all the time, which he isn't. And I said, so your a priori is, is that, that you don't logical. have any. Yeah. Is that you don't have any. You know, it's, <laughs> it's back to, there are no rules. Is that rule number one? You I, know, it's, it's I am, stuff self-destruct. I, I, I like that. There are no rules. Is that rule number one? What I model from you is that you ask people a question, like you'll attack a universal that they'll state or universal something like Universal quantifier, that, And yeah. you'll push it back on them. And challenge them to realize that they've just said something that doesn't actually make sense. Oh, yeah. And at that point, they've lost. And this, this isn't me. This is all Aristotle. Okay. This is Aristotle. The Greeks figured this out centuries ago. And as soon as you open your mouth, you hang yourself. Okay. You know, obviously, I said, Jay Quinlan, the police trainer, very good friend of mine, kung fu fighter, interesting guy, British, funny as heck. And he's the one who said, you know, no one can make a definite statement about anything. And I said, including, including the one you, the just, one you made. just made. And it was right. great to see his face as it integrated. That is a great one. Okay. So the challenge will be to use that technique on somebody in the coming weeks, folks listening. Okay, Mike, so do you have a closing metaphor for I us? I do, Chris. Go for it. It's a short one, but a good one. A number of years ago, I used to pass a small art shop on Kingston Road, not far from Kingston Road United Church, where you know we teach the British Jiu-Jitsu class down in the basement in the dungeons of the church by the bowling alley. Yes, there is one there. Yes. And I passed this and kept looking in the window as I passed because, you know, I'm a bit of an art fanatic. And as I looked through the window at some of these beautiful acrylic and oil paint and oil paintings as well, I saw one that caught my eye. And it was one of the old Toronto streetcars. Now, we still have streetcars, but they're all updated. And it was off the tracks, though. And it was in the, the window, the light shining down on it from the street in semi-darkness. And it was in snow. And you could see the snow all around it, the snow falling onto the streetcar itself and it was sort of coming towards the viewer and it was against a, an abstract background there were no buildings just sort of vague grayed out things as though you're looking through a screen of snow and the the streetcar was off the tracks by about two feet it was running through the snow but not on the tracks and this used to really interest me and then i'd glance at it as we passed and then one day months later i went by and looked in the window and the streetcar wasn't there anymore and I thought, oh, it's a shame. I used to like looking at that. It fired all these anchors of childhood streetcars and so on in Toronto. I noticed they'd hung it on a different spot in the window. It was to my left now. And when I looked at it, I realized it must have been a shadow, a trick of the light, because there were furrows 
in the snow, and the streetcar was firmly on the tracks, moving forward. And there's a sense that sometimes things aren't necessarily off the rails. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Brain Software with Mike Mandel and Chris Thompson. This has been session number 50, and we hope you've really enjoyed this one. We've put some extra effort into making it fun and just awesome, as always. Yeah. I want to make sure that I remind you all to head on over to MikeMandelHypnosis.com and opt in for our email list. You'll get a copy of Mike's Brain Software ebook, which really does contain life-changing stuff, similar to the stuff you've learned in this podcast, but action-packed and and quite compact and easy to read in one sitting and just learn a lot of really cool stuff. And on top of that, I do want to remind you that we have more live trainings coming up. We've got our June 7th and 8th Mindscaping class, the 2014 edition. Happening Still a few here in spots Toronto. left. Still a few spots left. And the May Hypnosis training, which will be over by the time this podcast goes live. Sold out since February. Sold out. And the November training, which happens the week of November 3rd, 2014. There are only 10 spots left left at this point and it's still several months away so it will be sold out if you want to attend with us in person live training the best hypnosis trainer on the planet mike mandel go over to mike mandel hypnosis.com forward slash class you'll get all the details and you can leave your deposit for your spot because it will sell out you know they say that um, opera really began at least with the first one we've got a record of back in 1600 and only seven years later Monteverdi came up with his wonderful opera, Orfeo. And in that one, the recitative was so good, they've never equaled it. But, you know, people ask me about it all the time. I like Richard Wagner more. And people say, how, how could you like him? You know, it's, it's so long, his operas, they go on forever. And, uh, it, you know, you've got to like Monteverdi. I mean, I like him a lot. But Wagner, I mean, there's just something about him. I listen to Richard Wagner... I just feel all nice and soft around the edges.